My name is Nick DeLeon from the Royal College of Art. I head up the service design program there. It's a real privilege to be here this afternoon. Um, you will notice my hand, and some of you might have some questions. What did he do? Well, we've just opened our studio. We've just moved studio, and uh, we've got 60 postgraduate students who have just moved to a brand new studio, and I got really stuck in. Talking about co-creation, I was co-building. And the shelving units collapsed on me. So I had a marvelous opportunity to go to the accident and emergency and do some research. <laughs> Eight stitches later, <laughs> the research was complete and they did a fantastic job. So I really threw myself into to that experience. Lead from the front, that's what they, they always tell you to do. Um, I also got the dress code wrong, I see, today. <laughs> in that I used to live in New York. I had two marvelous years living in this city uh, a little while back, and I just remember these weeks of the year being blue skies, so I put on a linen suit. And then they said, and the sponsor is Citibank. Who's from Citibank here? You don't have any ties on. <laughs> and you know, they said I had to get my best tie. So anyway, so there we go. <laughs> so I apologize for that. Well, they say never start with an apology, so I'm actually going to lead straight from that to that chart behind me right now. Um, there are 60 designers working in that studio. They're working on projects. We run masters and PhD programs, so if anybody's thinking about what to do next, come and talk to me later. You see the kind of sp project sponsors there. So we're working with Jaguar, who are about to launch a whole range of of new services, so you don't have to own a Jaguar to have a Jaguar experience, or own a Range Rover to have one of those. We've been working with the Ministry of Justice on a whole range of different projects, from uh, youth reoffending and how to reduce those kinds of rates, you know, um, through to the court service and the criminal system, and how to start thinking about not just co-creation here, but working with criminals who are going through those kinds of processes and seeing how we could influence new strategy for the Ministry of Justice and create new policies for the incoming government. And I'm going to talk to you about some of that later. We've been working with luxury retailers to try and help them understand what the movement is and how luxury retail itself is changing. And then to companies like Sainsbury, who are facing massive change. They're the second largest retailer in the UK. They're facing massive change right now in all of their business forced on them because of changing patterns of consumption. And that's really completely transforming the way that they operate. All of our students undertake these projects in order to be able to build their own personal capacity in the skills that we're developing. And we work with those organizations so that they can build that capacity inside the organization as well. So a kind of mutual exchange of value is taking place. And it's one which is crucial to us because we do a, a two-year program and the students will do five or six different projects during that time with major government or industry sponsors. But the most important thing that they get from all of that is an understanding about not just coming up with wonderful concepts, that wonderful blueprint that's embodied in a video that brings tears to your eyes with all that wonderful, inspiring music. You, as designers, you know all of those, right? How many of you are students here? Hands up. Any students? Yes. Are you good at making those? I saw there was a session tomorrow, I think, or maybe it's been this afternoon. It doesn't end there. That's my point. You've got to know something about some other topics as well. Business, digital. The average age of our students is now just over 30. They've come back to do new stuff if they've been in design or do new things altogether if they've come from other backgrounds. 20% of their training that they get with us is on the Imperial College MBA. Because if you're going to do things that are going to affect massive infrastructure, you're going to do things at scale, you better know about organizational behavior. You need to know about change management. You need to know about strategy. You need to know about business model innovation. You need to know how to translate that service proposition as a concept, not just into a blueprint that inspires, but into a solution on the ground. 
you know, the raw materials, I was trained as an industrial designer, but the raw materials that I worked with were plastics and metal and wood and all that kind of stuff. And I knew how to manufacture things. But the raw materials of services are something else, aren't they? They're the people who are going to do the stuff. The organizations that need to be transformed in order for that to happen. They're the business processes. That's like the manufacturing plant for it that need to be changed and transformed so that these services can be delivered effectively. That's why we need to immerse our students in the world of business as well. And they better understand the digital world, so they do 10% of Imperial College MSc in computing. Again, so they can translate those concepts into things that can be delivered, and they can take new technologies that are emerging and translate those into solutions that have compelling value for the end users and for their clients. Now, let's just talk about scale. This is uh, us emerging from Downing Street. We've just done a workshop for the cabinet office. It was a very good guy who was a special advisor to, uh, uh, to David Cameron, our prime minister, and then went over to, um, to the D school. Well, we like the D school, but we think we're pretty good too. <laughs> and Parsons is pretty good too. But we came out after running a workshop for over 200 officials. If you want to read about the workshop, there's a great book by Steve Hilton called More Human. Uh, it's putting the citizen, putting people at the center of service delivery and service innovation. Do get that book. I, I don't work for Steve, but I think that's a brilliant book. Now, let's just talk about scale for a moment. How, how big is the US public sector as a proportion of GDP? How big do you think it is? Who thinks it's under 30%? Over 30%? Over 40%? Many of you don't know. Do you? Anybody think it could be 50%? No, 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 no. That's, that's, that's the Europeans do that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Nah. 42.7%. Now, the amount raised in taxes for it is about 35%. You can do the maths, and that explains a lot of things. But let's take that 42%. We've seen a lot of stuff this morning on healthcare. How big is the healthcare? You all went to the, lecture, the, the talk this morning? Yeah, 17% of GDP. Is it private or public? That's 17%. Yeah, because I'll go and add a big chunk of that onto 42.7% to compare yourself to Denmark and Sweden and Norway and all those profligate countries that have all those public services, you're up there too, which is not a bad thing. You know, there's a lot to do, and government has a role in doing it, but it's going to change, and those services are a huge opportunity for service designers. So if you want to do stuff at scale, you know, there are a lot of big sectors to go after. And I'm going to talk mostly about going after the public sector and the kind of things that you can do. Now, at that meeting that we had in Downing Street, we talked about the alignment of coming up with policy, creating propositions that would enact that policy, turning those propositions into processes that the departments could execute, and then putting them into practice. And the fact is, is that none of that aligns very well. This is the kind of arrow that kind of shoots through. It starts when a policy decision is made on the hoof. Does that ever happen outside of the UK? <laughs> the current administration might have done a little of that. I don't know. You, you will know. But a policy decision is made on the hoof, perhaps it's because of some headlines in some newspapers, maybe it's because of some political intrigue or trying to kind of uh, outmaneuver people politically. Some propositions immediately have to emerge from the civil servants, the 400 people in the Ministry of Justice in the UK, whose job it is is just to focus on policy. 
the 1,000 people in the health service who work on policy. They have to work on this stuff as rapidly as possible. Then they invite in Accenture or Ernst & Young or IBM Business Consulting Services to kind of write the processes. And then what happens next? Some poor person in the front line has to put it into practice in Sunderland. <laughs> I am sure there's a Sunderland in America as well. But it's not a funny place, Sunderland. Might, I'm sure there's a lot of humor there, but not intentionally. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, now, you know, the, the premise of what we do is simply to say, before coming up with a policy, might it be quite interesting to go and use some of this kind of service design stuff to just kind of go out and test some scenarios? What might the citizen experience actually be? In fact, has all that big data stuff told you what's really going on? Now, you can, if you look at me, I'm, I'm not a young man, even though there's a young man inside here. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I've done, um, I, I'm very good at spreadsheets over the years. I've, I've, I've learned to really crack spreadsheets. Well, you're good at spreadsheets too? Yeah, you, you love spreadsheets, okay. <laughs> Can you ever have empathy with a cell on a spreadsheet? <laughs> no, it's not possible. Has anyone here ever been inspired? Inspiration from, you know, cell C23. <laughs> it doesn't happen, does it? You can't have empathy with a market segment, however good you are at marketing. It's a kind of abstraction of too much. You can have empathy and an understanding of, of people if you go out and look at them and observe them. You know, we had this session, this very moving session, actually, of thinking just now about thinking about the guys who are the subsea engineers and the issues that they face and, and how bringing those around the table together. You know, may, maybe you understand something a bit more. Now, starting to use service design, not just to come up with what some of those policy options might look like, but actually to inform whether the policy itself is right, bringing together the big data with the little data. Any business that's not doing that is missing a trick, and that's what we can do with service design. Help bring big data together with little data. And my goodness, it makes a difference in everything. So starting from the other end, not just figuring out how we use service design to enact the policy, not simply thinking about how to design the public services that are going to be delivered by it, but thinking about how we use service design at scale to influence policy, or in the case of the private sector, business strategy. How we can use it to understand what the citizen or the customer experience might be right down on the ground. We can use its research techniques to understand and inform and complement the big data with the little data. Now, that's a powerful thing to do. So it's about working from both ends. You know, policy, just like business strategy, sometimes it's going to start top down, but very rapidly making sure bottom up, you're informing it, you're informing what the possible outcomes are going to be, and then you're using the kind of deeply empathic and co-creative models that we're good at to start to deliver. Now, let me just talk about co-creation as well. Because I see the designer changing, particularly the service designer in this space. I think we are much more going to be like midwives, not having to conceive all the ideas, but helping those ideas that are created from the teams that we work with from the organizations as well as other disciplines internal to and external to the client or the government department, but giving voice to those and helping bring those into the world. And then nurturing them and taking them to the next level. You know, if you want to be Philip Stark and design another chair, oh God, I'm being videoed now. It's not going to talk to me again. 
then don't be a service designer. Our job is different. I would actually say it's a higher calling. I don't know that the world needs another chair or it needs another lamp. But I do know, <laughs> sorry, to all the industrial designers here, <laughs> I really put you off. OK, I'm going to, you know, wrong tie, everything's right. But, <laughs> but you've got to really kind of reflect on this. The stuff that we can do. You can go to Harvard Business School, and you can get yourself an MBA, and you become brilliant at knowing how to make decisions, because you get lots of decision-making tools. That's great. But, but you're not taught how to come up with some options to make decisions on. That's what you as designers do. That's what we as designers are all about. We might not end up making all the decisions, but we're the ones who come up creatively with the options for those who've been off to Harvard with their MBAs get to make decisions on. Now, some of you are probably thinking right now, well, I'd like to do service design and get an MBA as well. And then I can come up with the ideas and decide which ones we're going to do. <laughs> and I tell you, that's not a bad way to go. Right. Let's move on from here. Kind of, I, I, I've kind of shown this kind of a bit like a, a ladder here. Levels of impact from discrete problems, you know, through to kind of systemic in, interventions. Now, gov.uk, I, I just think is an amazing organization because, that, you know, it's, it's kind of like walking into a bit of Google or something. Gov.uk has really changed things in the UK government. For those of you who've not read about it, just get online, go and just type in gov.uk for a start and find out what it's all about. But the way that they have started with initially all the different websites that all the government departments had in the UK and managed to nail them into one architecture, one way of doing things, one way of simplifying it. And then hitting, first of all, all the informational services, then simplifying and transforming all the transactional services, and now moving into relational services. So, Gov.uk, big plug, very good at the kind of doing the discrete intervention around service interactions in basic transactional services, and now much more sophisticated ones. And not surprisingly, we work very closely with them, and we've got some of our graduates are, are, are in there now. Um, we also do that kind of stuff as well with the the private sector. So this is some work we did with Sainsbury's. How do you bring together the online experience and take it into the store and bring together that? Because when you walk into the store, they know nothing about you until you get to the checkout. But when you go online, they know everything about you. They literally reconfigure the store experience at that moment. So we've been working with them. Again, very straightforward service interactions. The kind of the next level is the kind of stuff of taking those services and seeing about service transformations. And this is where we do work with the Ministry of Justice, working not just with policymakers, but those on the ground who are looking at issues such as witness and, and victim support and how to support the witness so they turn up in court and we don't end up with more than 150 million pounds worth of court services that are wasted every year because there was no witness. And what does it mean to have no witness, no witness, no justice? So making sure witnesses and victims turn up is great. So what happens? A piece of software is developed called Track My Crime. It's an app. Is an app a solution? Is an app a service? No. They tried to deploy it, no good. We sent teams out, and we were brought in to take a look at it, to look at what the experiences really were, to try and understand what was really happening. What we discovered was in the Crown Prosecution Service, the court service, the police, the lawyers, the witnesses and the victims didn't know who was who. They were getting letters from every different person. The system was broken. How many of you know how your criminal justice system works? Except from the movies. 
because that's where we've learned about our criminal justice system. The first time you encounter it, you have to learn what it's all about. So we started drawing a lot of insights from this. People are very confused about what actually is the system. They don't understand it once they enter it. They find it immensely unresponsive. They never know what's going to happen, and they can wait months or weeks, never hear anything, and suddenly there's something that comes through from a party that they don't know where that fits in to it. They don't feel part of it or any sense of recognition from being a useful contributor to it. So we worked through that with them. We did all the normal kind of user mapping and everything else. Uh, a team, interestingly, of three German and a Japanese student worked on this, which is very interesting to think of a team like that sorting out the British criminal justice system. And they came up with a solution. Let me quickly show you uh, a little bit of that. We have no sound. So I'm not going to show you that bit. <laughs> Let me move on to a project which is further up the ladder, the Department of Health. This is designed for systems. Um, would you, I think it's reasonable to say in the UK we have a healthcare system. <laughs> I'm not going to ask the other question. But I think there is a system there because there are a set of interrelated components where there are relationships between those, where the outcomes are reasonably predictable, the system itself is understood in terms of its key principles by those who work in it and those who are the recipients of care. To me, that is a system. It has all the attributes of components, relationships, rules. You may question whether or not in, you, you could call healthcare in the US a system. But you have to have those components that are for it. One of the most challenging things for healthcare systems right now is the interrelationship between health and social care. And are there things that you can do at a social level that might alleviate a kind of time bomb of the future in terms of healthcare costs? Are there things that instead of prescribing as a doctor medicine, that you describe or prescribe for them services that they can undertake in the community? That's a very, very important step that's happening right now in the UK in terms of health and social care. So we've been working at a systems level on that. Another area we've been working on is about looking at how patients are discharged from hospital. Now, very interestingly, we've been working with the UK's largest health trust. It runs nine hospitals, it has more than 20,000 people working for it. How do you think it takes people home, because 30% of them end up coming almost straight back. It's outsourced it. Now, let me mention a number of different firms, and I'm not going to say which one of these is the outsource partner. FedEx, UPS, DHL. Now, <laughs> see some, that's how when they decide that you're ready to go home, you're going to go home. The contract is such that the multidisciplinary team fills in forms like this. Wellness. Yes, they're breathing. This is a real form. <laughs> it's not a joke. It's a real form. Nursing home ready. The district nurse will get involved. Do we need any post-discharge care? The Red Cross are involved. That's how they're going to make a decision about sending that person home with UPS, FedEx, or DHL. Now, I respect all of those companies in terms of their operational efficiency. They can get a cardboard box to leave with my neighbor and do it really well. But I do not want a letter through the door saying, dear Mr. DeLeon, your mother is with your next door neighbor. <laughs> you don't need that much empathy 
with cardboard. <laughs> you know, but <laughs> getting it through the door. So when do you start planning this coming back to a systems intervention? Not just putting a service wrap around a bit of software, which is what we ended up doing with the criminal justice system and making it much tidier, but something else. What do you have to do? You have to intervene much, much earlier. Much, much earlier in the whole experience. When, not just when they come into hospital, but you have to start the whole preparation. We developed a program. We're now starting to deploy with that as the first health trust called Prepare to Care. So that when you have your GP appointment and they say, Mrs. DeLeon, that knee joint's going to need to be replaced. It's going to be about three months. We ought to start thinking now about what kind of care because you're not going to be able to stand at the sink and do the washing up. You're not going to be able to do the ironing. You're not going to be able to hoover. You're not going to be able to get your tights on. Pantyhose, just so you know. Now, I lived in America, so I know these things. <laughs> so prepare to care <clears throat> starts there and building not just your care network to look after you, but also encouraging you as part of the program to start being ready to care for your neighbors, particularly in a community that's aging. The next level is kind of moving up, and uh, Christian today talked about um, Mind Lab. In the UK, we have Policy Lab working with the design of policy. And the area that I want to just share with you here, finally, is the work we've been doing with the Chilean government. Uh, President Michel Bachelet, um, one of the people that worked very much on her uh, digital campaign, his reward was coming to spend four years with us to do a PhD. And we've been working with them on the design of the Laboratorio de Gobierno, the new policy lab, or mind lab equivalent, an innovation lab for Chile. And the thing about Chile, which is different from, let's say, the UK, in the UK, we're trying to find ways of not spending money on public services, because there isn't any money left. In Chile, they're looking to go from about 20% up to about 35% very quickly. So they need to design services and find new ways, because they don't have the capacity at scale to do it in-house. So what we've been working with them is taking a model that you might say, let's frame the problem, experiment, implement, but you can inform policy and go around that loop informing policy and then implementing. We've looked at it in terms of a few other steps that are part of it, a kind of seven-step model that's part of this. And uh, all my sh slides here will be available for you because I, I see it's not kind of come up quite as brightly as I'd hoped there. Um, how you coordinate the stakeholders, design the propositions, build the prototypes, all of that. But one of the important elements of this, as we look at it, is building this kind of ecosystem, the innovative ecosystem. So these are the four components of the model. Innovation projects, which allow you to build capacity inside, demonstrate the effectiveness of these models, and produce exemplars of it. That innovation capacity is not limited only to those organizations that are uh, specifying and delivering those services, but it's also to the ecosystem of partners that you're trying to nurture to bring them in. So here, the service designers developed a service set of propositions and develop them to the level of service blueprints. And then with those, instead of the normal challenge that you'd send out to all the private sector who can help fulfill public services, instead, they sent out those videos and the stories and the blueprints. Instead of them getting half a dozen companies, which is typically what happened, more than 200 companies from 14 different countries came in and said, we can help deliver that. Now, that's an important part of this. Because whether you're a business in the private sector or a government, you know that the solutions are not going to come all in-house. You're going to need to build an ecosystem, whether it's in fintech companies that can come in and show how they can deliver it, or for the financial services, or whether it's with government. And that's what this model does. And the first project, which was done as part of this, is now being deployed in Santiago. And I will leave 
a little video for another time because I know I've come to the end of my 30 minutes. But I thank you for giving me the opportunity to present to you today. Thank you.